Ooh, howdy, howdy, everybody. Sam Goodman, the Hot Nerd, coming to you from the sunny and the beautiful downtown Phoenix, Arizona, here in the Pell Horse Media Co. Studios, the home of the safety anarchists, the safety misfits, the safety others. On today's podcast replay, we are joined by the awesome Tanya Hewitt. Here we go. Thank you for coming and hanging out. This has been awesome. I've heard, well, it has been. This is going to be awesome. <laughs> Let me say that. I've been. I've done too many, too many video calls this morning. <laughs> this is going to be a blast. Thank you for reaching out. I look forward to it. This is going to be really cool. Well, actually, you're the one who should be thanked for doing what you're doing, right? I mean, you're the one who is putting yourself out there and having your your podcast, your university, your mm-hmm. your book, your you know all of this stuff. You're you're obviously you know, making a difference to a lot of people. Trying to. And that's, that's so much of what I've tried to focus on is just exactly that. Just trying to make things a little bit better. That's the, I think that's the, uh, if at the end of the day, if I can say that, you know, just made things just even just the slightest bit better. That's all. That's uh, that's all. That's all I want. That's all, that's all I, want. I kind of pigeonhold myself. I keep sharing this sort of, I kind of pigeonhold myself into this whole hop thing, but it's really, for me, it's just better. It doesn't matter if it's hob. It doesn't matter if it's safety differently. It's really just safety better. All things kind of, kind of better. Just making the world a little bit better place to work, <laughs> which is, yeah. which is interesting, which is a lot, which is a lot of kind of, I think what we'll dive down because um, you and I had went back, back and forth a little bit in email talking about uh, some stuff around reporting. I don't, I, we didn't, uh, um, yeah, I don't know if you've listened to the podcast, but it's very conversational. I don't script anything. We don't script anything. We just kind of take the conversation wherever we feel like taking it. People seem to enjoy that. So they kind of like being the fly on the wall as we just dive into whatever, whatever the heck we feel like diving into. So (laughs) a lot of our conversation originally started around some stuff with uh, reporting though, right? We started to, started to talk a little bit, I can't talk this morning about reporting. And that's, that's really what I was really interested in starting the conversation with. If that's okay, I'd like to really dive down into some of your thoughts on reporting uh, and really the question that a lot of organizations uh, ask me um, is this, is they're like, well, how do we make people report stuff? And for me, the first, the first thing that I tell them and that they struggle with is this, is that all reporting is voluntary, yeah. right? They, they forget that element that all reporting is, is, is voluntary. Even if they write down a, a fancy rule that says fire you, if you don't report, it's still voluntary. <laughs> so how do, how do organizations start down that path of, of increasing reporting? Well, the, I think part of this is, if we back it up a little bit, mm-hmm. a lot of um, knee-jerk reactions to accidents that are reported in the media mm-hmm. tend to focus on if they had or did not have a reporting system. And right. of course, either way, it's not a good answer because, I mean, this, this uh, terrible thing happened and the reporting system didn't stop it from happening. So um, the you can have a very, um, you know, almost juvenile view of a reporting system in this way. Yeah. Uh, but if you're actually going to put in a reporting system, you've got to be ready for a very complex socio-technological system. It's, mm-hmm. it's a bigger deal than just some software right so you know the if 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 companies don't have a reporting system it's incumbent upon them i think to do a little bit of homework to figure out what they're getting themselves into because i don't think a lot of people who do get into reporting systems understand what it is they're responding probably to public pressure because of something that happened yeah and that's, that's a lot of, uh, that's some of the conversation we'd had kind of through email before is that, um, you know, I, I grew up kind of in commercial nuclear generation uh, in a field in which obviously that's something that, that they, I'll say they prioritize. Let me, <laughs> for the folks listening to the podcast, they can't see my air quotes. <laughs> they, they prioritize this, obviously, um, for obvious reasons, right? We're, we're dealing with stuff that can, obviously, we, we want to know. Uh, we're dealing with things that could dramatically affect the public. There's just all kinds of reasons to have that there, right? And public pressures, as we mentioned, all these different reasons to have those there. Um, as we kind of went down that path, you still see that a lot of organizations stumble, right? They, they tend to stumble and, and kind of, I don't even know the best way to put it. They just kind of don't do so great <laughs> with the reporting systems. So often it seems like they don't know how to handle what they're getting. 
right? Somebody says, Hey, this is really, really, really bad. And I want to tell you about it. And then all of a sudden the reaction tends to say something different, right? It's how much of that has to do with the reactions that the, that the organization gives back to the employees. Hugely, hugely. In fact, I um, have uh, said that in, if you're, if you're going to a lot of a lot of uh, incident reporting systems are not uh, custom off the shelf things. They are right. in house products, and um, if you're going to do something like that, um, do yourself a favor. So when I when I uh, did so I studied incident reporting systems for my doctoral work, mm. and I had uh, conceptualized incident reporting systems as having three main buckets. So the first bucket is on detection of something. And that's where the majority of effort is put, you know, on trying to get people to report. Um, And the user interface and all this kind of thing. There's a second bucket that's talking about the analysis. How is it that the the input is being treated? So that's, that's a whole bucket on its own that I saw. And then there's another bucket after that. What do you do with that information? Mm -hmm. So I would counsel people to think about, um, you know, maybe something that doesn't seem sensical, but look at the incidents reporting system backwards. Think about what you're going to do with information when you get it. Right. First, before you even think about, you know, user interface and, you know, posters and stuff. What are you going to do with the information? How will you handle something that says we have corrupt senior management? Right. You know, that we are not, we are not, a, um, uh, we are not operating according to our purpose. Like, you know, right. what are you going to do with this information? Right. So if you're not able to handle that information, maybe you don't want to be in this space at all, you know? Yeah. Because that's the kind of, this is the sandbox in which you're in. It kind of goes to, it's, it's almost that be careful what you ask for. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. I think you're spot on because so much of what you see is when we have the big, bad, awful thing, right? When somebody takes as courageous enough to write that down and whatever the system looks like, as you said, that's a whole nother monster, right? I I can go down that, that rabbit hole of, of these clunky wonky systems that there's like 70 pages long to try to report something. And I will say that, let me, let me throw that out there. At least my experience uh, here stateside with commercial nuclear generation is that their kind of condition reporting systems have been pretty simple to use. I will say that they're pretty open and transparent about the ease of use and how to get those things out there and very easy to find and use and all that kind of stuff. Um, I didn't mean to pick on them too bad. I'm, I'm not, I'm not really picking on them, uh, but there are some clunky kind of wonky systems out there. Um, but yeah, it's interesting because so much of what, what happens is when they, when we finally get someone that has the courage to say that stuff, we go, Oh my God, gosh, how could, no, 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 that can't be, that can't be true. That doesn't align with what I think the organization has going on. That doesn't align with my assumptions around the organization. So it must be wrong or it must be something, right? And we dismiss it or we respond poorly to it uh, or we go into full panic mode, which is probably even worse. It seems like in most cases where we over respond to something and now all of a sudden no one's going to say anything, right? It doesn't seem like anybody's going to use that, that system again, at least. Absolutely. The, I mean, you have to remember, as you, as you correctly pointed out, people are taking of their time, putting into their words, something that they believe is of value. If that is, I mean, abuse might be too strong a word, but if that's not recognized for what it is, then of course, the people will not report because it takes a lot of courage to be able to, to, to stand up, to be able to speak truth to power, to be yes. able to, you know, say something. And if, or maybe it's even, maybe it doesn't even have to be that grandiose. Maybe this is just something operational that really, this is, this is obstructing our work. This is a time waster. This is making things harder, whatever. Um, And it's not given due consideration in that progression that I talked about, the analysis and actually doing something, the learning part, 
then why would people report again? You know, what's you, you de-incentivize the whole thing. Well, and that's it, right? Reporting is always a risk to the person reporting. Right? Yes. It's, it's always going to be a risk. And no, no matter how, e- I know how, how easy, well, I cannot talk about, I've talked too much today. <laughs> no matter how easy we try to make it, it's always going to be a headache. It's going to be a risky headache to report. And that's what I try to share with, with leaders all the time is if someone is taking, let me back up just a second, because we all, we've all been in that position. If, if, for those folks out there listening that have been around leadership, you've all been in that position where someone has probably brought you something and you've went, Oh, really? This, right. This, oh, that's so, so minor. That's this, or that's, you know, again, we kind of just uh, kind of be dismissive before we even say anything. Uh, and then so often, you know, we have to understand that to that person, I guess I'm going to sneak in here for those that, <laughs> that are listening to the podcast. My daughter's sneaking in behind me <laughs> for that person. That's actually reporting it. It's the most important thing to them. Right. Even if it's something, it seems like like no risk at all to us. It seems like something that's so unimportant to maybe us as a leader. And it might, it might be to us, right? But to the person that's reporting that, it is the most important thing at that time to them for them to go be willing to take that risk and go through that headache and tell us that information. Uh, and we have to shy away from being so dismissive sometimes, right? Absolutely. And I mean, you know, I've also heard um, people talking about um, frivolous reports uh you know we ran out of coke in the coke machine okay fair enough yeah. but what was your messaging report everything right if you if you if you're actually wanting people to report everything <laughs> then yeah there wasn't enough you know there wasn't enough salt on the ice outside there wasn't uh, that guy didn't smile at me when i walked in like wait what are you actually asking right so you know it, it's it's a socio technical system, and you have to understand how people are actually going to respond to this yeah. when it's yeah. put into practice. Yeah, I think that that's that's exactly it. Um, one one piece that I wanted to touch on a little bit, and again, I I don't mean to like take us all over the map here, uh, but I'm just I'm just interested to pick your brain. I'm just loving to get the opportunity to just have this conversation and pick your brain a little bit. Um, we had touched just a little bit on kind of culture surveys kind of that kind of stuff. It seems like at some point with most organizations, they decide to go down this path uh, and I'll, I'll throw out the buzzword. They'll go down the path of assessing safety culture in their organization. And they'll usually do that through some kind of wacky form <laughs> type thing, you know, and then they're trending results of some kind. It's, it's, it's most of what I, ha- what I have come into contact with throughout my career uh, is all seem to be kind of loosely based on this skiwi model that we see adopted in commercial nuclear generation. Um, what, how can folks maybe look at, checking or pulsing their culture maybe better than the ways we've kind of done it in the past. Okay. So let's just um, uh, unpack a little bit of what you just said. Um, So there are a few different tried and true social uh, science ways to study people. And that's really what we're talking about. If we're looking at culture, we were wanting to study people. Right. And, um, Surveys, which are what you alluded to, um, are, at least in my estimation, one of the more difficult ways to go because they are, they are themselves a socio-technical kind of thing. Right. I mean, right. there is so much to a survey, yeah. not well beyond just um, the constructs that you're asking but how you're asking them, mm-hmm. the words that you, the language you're choosing, yes. the, the order of, of asking things, not to mention the administration of the survey, who's, who's going to see this, who's over my shoulder looking at this, how long do I have, am I being paid to do this? There's on and on and on and on and on. So surveys are, um, I mean, they, obviously they have a place in in society a whole lot of uh you know organizations out there uh depend on survey data to be able to assess large populations uh, opinions on things but i have uh i'm i'm not a huge fan of surveys simply because i filled out many surveys myself and i have had questions whereby 
well, I don't even know how I feel about this. Like, I don't feel, you know, like, I, I don't know. So yeah. I guess, I guess middle of the road or, or something. Yeah. I don't know. And, and then if I do have a strong opinion, maybe I'd like to give some context to that. Maybe I want to tell you a story about what exactly happened. Like, I don't know if that's what you're asking, but it, like, it seems like this, there's no opportunity to do that. So there's, there's so much in surveys. And I mean, I, that I'm just scratching the surface. No, there is so very much in surveys uh, that um, I uh, don't think a lot of people who use them understand. And, uh, yeah. and, I, yeah, I, and I'm just talking, and I'm not, I'm not even talking about um, what you do after the survey's filled out. You know, once the survey's filled out, then there's all sorts of statistics that you can do that probably people don't understand what they're doing when they're doing that. So, there, you know, there's a whole, it's, it's really, it's of the very various ways to study people. That one is pretty complicated. Yeah. So. Yeah. And that's, that's what I've kind of seen with it is, is, is that for me, you kind of went down the path a little bit of, of some of my beef with the survey is that it's really hard to contextualize what you're looking at, right? You can't kind of peel back and look at that story. You can't listen through the survey, really. You can just kind of get this really broad set of data and just maybe, maybe get general feelings of certain things. Uh, but to your point, most folks that use surveys just kind of pull together some questions. They'll throw right. a Likert scale on it. <laughs> Yeah, just gonna throw yeah. it out there. Exactly. And, and so often, uh, you know, I've been in those positions where I've had organizations will push you into write a survey, and you even just writing some of those questions. I myself have stepped back and come back to it. my bias is showing so wildly Absolutely. through a lot of these questions. I'm going. I know what my opinion is. I'm writing my opinions. <laughs> I've got to stop and not do that, right? <laughs> it's very hard. Right. It's extraordinarily hard to do that. Yeah. And I mean, at least you were self-aware enough to recognize it. There might be a lot of people who, who write surveys who aren't so self-aware. Right. And um, and they're therefore they're they're getting a whole bunch of data back that really is just responding to the way they want to hear. You know. So an interview exactly. can go that way as well, right? Sure. You if you're not if you're not self-aware enough to understand the influence that you are having on an interview, mm -hmm. you will definitely get a, portray information either through your body language or your, the words you choose or the, the, you know, the order in which you speak all the, all the right. uh, same kind of things uh, plus the, the physical presence uh, from a survey. Uh, you uh, will just get back what you want to hear. Right. which is not what a cultural survey should be doing. Oh, right, right, right. And I, that's, that's where I've seen, um, I've, I've had quite a bit of hands-on experience with a lot of organizations going down this path of doing more of a focused group based, uh, more of listening sessions, right? It's, it's yeah. really a listening session. And so much of, of those really getting to the point of listening sessions being successful, right in line with what you're saying. The facilitator matters a lot, very much, right? And making sure that you have a a, a really a, a really good vetted list of facilitators that you train and that they understand all of these things before you just throw someone out there. Because many organizations go, "Oh, that's a very safety conscious person. Just throw them out there to to do this. Right. That's yeah, fine." No, yeah. Or just send out our safety committees, or send out a leader, right, to do that. And we even see that right. in uh, even back to kind of the paper surveys, um, in which you know they'll just kind of print something and then just disperse them through leadership and down through the chain of an organization and say, just send them back to us. Uh, and again, it just seems to, it not seems it really does. It's, it skews the results that we get. I think we'll see that with the facilitator. If you have a facilitator that has very strong personal feelings, maybe not even that strong, I guess it doesn't have to be that strong. Do you have a facilitator that's leaning in either direction, just their words, you can lead people into saying the things or you can kind of press the button that you want to press, so to speak and drive people to maybe anger or maybe not, not as angry as they should be. Right. You just move yeah. them in different directions and sometimes completely unknowingly, right. You're just, just from, just from, just from your words you use. Absolutely. So, um, of, of the five main methods, we've covered three of them. Um, you can also do, um, probably this one might be something that is uh, more tangible, but it depends on what people are looking at, document reviews. Mm. So you can take a look at what an organization writes about itself. So 
you know, look at its website, look at its uh, literature, look at look at all the posters on the wall, look at, right. and and try to pull out what what does it value, what is of importance here, what words are they using in their in their literature? What you can get a whole lot of insight as to how the uh, company or the uh, organization operates if you just look at how it writes about itself. Right. In its, I mean, I mean, you can get even uh, in, in all of its corporate communications. You can get even more if you can get a hold of meeting minutes and things like yes. this. Yeah. What is it that they are recording? What, who, you know, what, what are they, what are they putting attention to? What are they not putting? You know, who, a whole lot of things like this can be gotten just from documents. Yeah, and I, th- I think that's a very interesting point that you bring up because you can you can really evaluate, uh, and it's probably something that a lot of people don't think about, right? Uh, you know, you, you can really evaluate that culture from those artifacts that are present in absolutely in, in the organization, right? I think what's really interesting is when you can kind of find. Um, we'll pick on the posters a little bit, right? You'll we'll pick on the posters and every organization tends to have this, this poster of values that they place all over their organization. And I think there's a really interesting play, place to explore when you go out into those organizations and you see what they post and then what's actually present, right? Yes. When you see the gap between value and the actual actions in the organization. I think that's a really interesting, uh, maybe painful painful yep. wound to get into but that's a very interesting place it seems if you would want to go down and explore culture deeply yeah you want to know another trick you can use and i learned this uh, in a training session that i attended years and years ago um pull the values off the wall and put those down and mm. take a look at last year's budget what did you spend your money on that's, that's so take excellent. off take off your capital expenses and your salaries you know like all of the discretionary spending where did you spend your money so you're an innovative company, you're an innovative company in your values. Well, okay. So where did you prove that, you know, in how right. you actually spent your money, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. You just kind of, I had one of those kind of moments there when you said that <laughs> I, had, I never actually thought about that. That's an excellent approach uh, because that's in an organization, there, there gets no greater action than spending cash yeah. <laughs> a lot of times, right? That's really how, how we you, back up a lot of those values, right? Exactly. So if you say that, you know, you, you, uh, people are our greatest resource, we value our people and yet you see that they haven't spent much money on training. They haven't spent much money on team development or on, mm. uh, you know, leadership or whatever. You start to question, really? I mean, you're saying that people are your greatest resource, but you're not investing in them at all. You're not spending money on them, which is how you would measure investment. Wow. That's, that's, yeah. Any, any other, um, any other kind of pitfalls or air traps that folks out there can avoid when it comes to maybe trying to go out and pulse culture? A lot of, a lot of what oh, I've there's one, there's to, one more oh, tool ahead, though that we haven't yeah. covered. So all of these, I mean, we were talking about the nuclear industry. There is a wonderful document that I will encourage anybody who's interested in this kind of stuff to take a look at. It's from the International Atomic Energy Agency. So that has um, a plethora of documents, all of which are publicly accessible. Um, And it's called Safety Report Series Number 83, Performing Safety Culture Self-Assessments. And it is fantastic so it talks about surveys interviews focus groups document reviews and observations so observations is the other social science tool that can be used but of course again the person doing the observation has to be super self-aware they've got to be um there is you can be trained in order to be able to do these things to try not to be judgmental when you're doing them. that's the whole point about this right you're not judging the judging comes after you collect the data you have to collect the data neutrally and then uh then you can um deal with any of the judgment that you want to apply to it much later but you have to be uh, authentic to the data that you collect i can give you a short uh, short anecdote when i was yeah. um going to school one of my professors had said that she was looking at um the dene nation in northern canada and because of climate change they are beginning to get interested in like backyard gardening and um she she comes from you know an urban environment and so she 
she's not really into gardening, but fair enough. If that was how she was going to get access to this community, fair enough. She'd uh, try to learn how to garden. So that was number one. Like she would meet the needs of the people that she wanted to talk to, not impose her needs to them. Secondly, so she went out there um, and was gardening with them. And they were, you know, uh, planting seeds and, uh, you know, um, shoveling things and you know, shoveling the soil and things like this. But as, as her, um, as it turned out, um, you know, community of interest was doing this, they were talking about things as you do, right? Like as you do, and then this is like, the equivalent of locker room talk could be garden talk for women kind of thing, you know? So, uh, so there's lots of, lots of information that she was learning while they were gardening. And every once in a while, she would have to say, excuse me, I have to go to the shed to get another tool. And she would go to the shed and she would take out the notepad that she had in her back pocket and she would try to vomit all of the information that she got and to be able to get the words as close as she could get them, be as authentic to her subjects as she possibly could. And this is what observation is. It is engaging with your community but still being distant from them so that you can analyze them, you know, with, in a cultural way. So that's it. But I mean, I don't know how many people actually know this in the workplace. You know, I don't know mm -hmm. the, the workplace ethno eth ethnologists that I know of um, are first off very few. <laughs> There's not a right. whole lot of ethnography done in workplaces right, right. and uh, B um, the, uh, I think a lot of the standard tools of the survey is still more of the, the norm kind of thing. So, but there's, there's so much richer uh, field out there if you're willing to take advantage of it. Exactly. And I think that's something that's really, really interesting as you kind of went down that path. Um, so many people in organizations, their, their view of um, the kind of, here's my air quotes again, of observations, have been very skewed by kind of this notion of behavior-based safety nice. and all that stuff that was thrown out there that I'm going out and I'm looking at rule versus behavior and I'm, I'm, I'm pulling people back to, to kind of get back into the kind of hop and safety differently space. I'm pulling people back to the black line and I'm comparing them to this, this black line, the rules, the procedures, the work as imagined, and I'm forcing them back towards that the compliance state. Uh, and really, as, as to, to hear kind of a different view on observation that you just laid out there, that's way different than kind of that coach correct, go out uh, kind of stuff that we normally see in the safety space. Uh, now that we're having that conversation, it really makes me think that if we're going out to try to at least get an idea of culture in an organization, we really have to get out of that state, wouldn't we? We'd really have to get into the state of just being kind of an independent observer at that point, kind of a way... Yeah but trusting enough it, to where you can see the normal behaviors and normal kind of interactions and normal conversations, but far enough away to where you could still be separate from that. I think maybe something that might help because I was, I've been struggling with this for a long time, trying to make sure that I was able to uh, communicate this to people who have a non um, social science background, which is the majority of the audience who needs to hear it. So, I mean, a lot of people are um, hung up on biases, you know, I, oh my God, that's going to be biased. Well, you know, it's, you know, okay, look, what we're doing is, is taking a measurement and any measurement, it, it doesn't really matter what it is. If it is, you know, using a weigh scale, if it's using, you know, a radiation meter, if it's using whatever, Look at the manufacturing specifications. There is going to be a systematic and a random error associated with any kind of right. measurement. Right. So when you're talking about people measuring other people, the bias maybe can be seen as just this kind of systematic error. You know, that, uh, and then having, yeah. there's, a, there's a randomness perhaps because, uh, on top of that, because, uh, we all get into different moods, right? Sometimes we're super happy and excited to be doing this kind of work. Other times we're really bummed about it. And that right. all of this is going to influence how you collect the data. So it's, but the other thing to remember is that similar to a scientific experiment, there, there is 
a separation between data collection and data analysis. You know, when you collect the data, you shouldn't be analyzing. You should just be collecting the data because you have to go through the formula and everything in order to know what the analysis is. Right. So it's the same thing with these cultural assessments. When you're collecting the data, you shouldn't be imposing a judgment because you're, you want the data to be as true as you can. It's hard enough with the biases and the moods and all this stuff. If you, if you can suspend the judgment for as long as you possibly can in collecting the data, then you can go, you can go and analyze the data if you then have to apply some kind of judgment to it because of a black line somewhere, okay. But don't let that influence you on collecting it in the first place. Wow. Yeah, exactly. The, the, exactly. I think that's so powerful. I think there's, there's, to your point, I think there's a lot of folks out there that really need to try to tune in. And I think it's something with, within the safety profession that we really have to think about trying to evolve more towards that understanding. Right. Most safety professionals that I that I've come across, most of them grew up in this really this really heavy compliance uh, based state. And there really wasn't a lot of conversation about this kind of stuff right. in the past. Right. It was more of here's here's the rule book. We want you to be the enforcer. We don't care about any of the rest of it. You just go forth and make sure that people follow the rules. Um, but as we've started to understand with safety two, as we started to understand with safety differently, hop as we kind of start to move move into the space. For those that are tuning in the podcast, they're they're missing out on on my daughter over here. She's she's playing with my my bobblehead of the queen <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> but I think there's something to be said about that. To maybe exploring and evolving what our profession does kind of in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, uh, I, th I think, I, I think there can be, um, it, it, there's just so much more that we can learn about how organizations really function than sending out a survey or even doing a learning team. Like there's, there's a lot there that you're able to, to harness. It does take some effort and it does take some dedication and it takes right. some self-discipline because again, You've got to be, the self-awareness is really critical because, you know, if, if you are angered because, you know, your daughter erased a podcast or something like that, you're going to be not in the same frame of mind as if, you know, um, something good happened, you know, and this, this whole situation that we were talking about, you know, with, um, all of the protests going on right now in the U S this could be severely affecting people's mental states. Sure. And this has to be taken into consideration. There was one of my colleagues was uh, talking about doing a, a cultural assessments uh, years ago in, in, in Pakistan, I think. And before they started, they had to do some self declarations. They had to write down things like where they were raised and what impact that might have on how they see the world, what disciplines they studied, and, um, you know, what biases they, they believe they have kind of thing. And this was out on the table. So everybody could see, you know, what, what, what Sam's self-declared biases are, what, how, right. what his upbringing was like, and all this kind of thing. So when you were undertaking the exercise of doing the analysis, people could see, what, and Sam is starting to go down this rabbit hole. Ah, Sam, remember, that might be because of what you had said about, you know, how you were raised. Like, maybe that's not actually what the analysis we should be doing here. That might be more of your personal view on this. Huge, huge, you know, to be able to yeah. try to get a collective understanding. Yeah. No, that's, that's absolutely massive. I, I think there's so much to be said there. There's so much that we can explore, especially going down that path. I mean, so many organizations, especially now, seem to be starting to wake up to this conversation, at least of biases. And we're starting to wake up to this conversation of at least how we do a better job of exploring uh, the cultures uh, within our organizations. I think you bring up some really amazing points that we usually forget as we kind of go down the path of at work. We tend to think that, that work is just at work, but all those external factors influence everything at work as well, right? I mean, uh, we were uh, um, 
earlier in the day, we were just having this conversation around this, this notion of doing, making safety kind of entertaining. So this will date the podcast a little bit for folks that, <laughs> that just noticed this will come out of, you know, a couple of days later at least. But, but um, you know, you, that's one thing that I've noticed with, uh, with, with some organizations here in Arizona, you know, as I mentioned, a, a, a significant portion of the state of Arizona uh, is the Navajo Nation. Right. And there's there's such a different culture that you find in these different locations uh, that you have to consider as well. Right. You can't just say, well, no, this is our company and our culture is this. And this is how we. you have to really take into consideration how those different things impact throughout the organization. You have different cultural impactors from everything. Right. Not only from upbringing, but from the communities in which these locations are at to the individuals themselves, just all kinds of different things that we have to to understand. I think uh, there's a lot to be said around this concept of um, we've tried to take these things that are very complex right and organizations have tried to make them not complex just by saying they're not complex anymore right? <laughs> yeah. we, we, we try to we try to take these things that are very complex in nature safety is a prime example of that right yeah. just look at look at any any event and post event we, we the organization will clearly lay out how that is not complex but it, it truly is right is the definition of complexity it is the definition of non-linear as to how many of these things occur right uh, but i think there's something to be said there to embracing that complexity and leaning into it for what it is instead of just trying to go down i cannot you, you might be able to tell i hear some bias i have some beef with the, with a lot of the surveys at least the way that they're traditionally done. instead of just throwing out a survey and saying here you go that's we'll use that right <laughs> So, I mean, another thing about uh, surveys is that um, you likely are going to put those into histograms of some sort, mm -hmm. and likely they're going to be used to compare different, uh, different people to different people. And the histograms are, uh, another thing, are likely, um, they could be anyway, um, collected organization-wide, you know, and, and so then we have this this reigning histogram as to how we are as a company. But culture, if it's to be respected, is local, right? right, right. So if you are wanting to do some overall company or, or organization messaging, that is at the expense of the cultural granularity that you have at the local right, level. Yes. So, I mean, you can do it, but you have to be at least aware and if not overtly communicating that we have rolled up a whole bunch of things into this one whatever statement histogram and histogram is a horrible way to represent culture by the way yeah but you know whatever it is that you're going to do a story would be lovely you know like that would be a, a better way but but it's not it's not being faithful to the data that you've collected if you've done it right I think there's there's so much there. Uh, that's a conversation I was having the other day, uh, not necessarily around culture, but it, it, it was in around just general safety stuff. Or I was having that conversation with an organization, uh, and there's this need to try to make things the same for whatever reason. It, it kind of takes on this old style fleet safety management system, where it's like the way to make things safe is to make everything the same everywhere you go throughout your fleet of power plants or throughout your fleet of manufacturing facilities. As long as it's the same, everything's fine. <laughs> But no matter how much organizations try to, and I'm not saying like there's, there's some great things out there that we probably want some consistency around, right? Yes. There's there is a things. role for standardization. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. There is a role for standardization uh, where it makes sense, but it doesn't yes. make sense for everything as we've kind of went down this path of thinking for a long time that it makes sense for everything. Um, right. Speaking of even in and around different power plants, um, you know, growing up, in and around power plants every power plant has such a unique personality right every location that you go to beyond manufacturing facilities it doesn't matter they all have such a unique personality i think there's something to that in embracing that uniqueness right i think there's really something empowering to that as well about embracing the uniqueness of a location embracing the uniqueness uh, of some site uh, and obviously you know kind of bolstering up the good stuff from that uniqueness um what are your thoughts on that? How, how do you, how do you view kind of the, the uniqueness be around different locations and organizations? So I think, I think there's a, you bring up a really good point there because um, there is a tendency for people to want to um, copy the leader, right? So you want, so if some, you're talking about power plants. So some power plant has some kind of, rating from the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, 
somebody else wants that same rating because look at the accolades they're getting. So we're going to copy what they're doing. But that is, again, uh, not taking into account the social part of your, your work. Yeah. You, there is a uniqueness. And a lot of the successful um, programs or initiatives might not be transferable in other contexts, depending on what allowed it to be successful in the first place. And sometimes you might not even know because it's, because A, we're not looking at that, where we look at failure far more than we do success. And B, even when it is successful, it's, it's very difficult to, to try to understand it the entirety of what allowed uh, an initiative to become successful. Yeah. And um, it might not be um, tractable. It might not be, you know, uh, copyable in that way. So it's, that's one thing that I'd say about uniqueness. There's, I, I think it's the, the more that you're driving to um, get the same kind of, uh, well, say a grade, if, you, if, if, if you're looking at, you know, in, in, info ratings as being the, the one that I'm thinking of, um, then instead of looking at what that plant did, take a look at yourself and see how you can get there on your own. And, you know, right. try, look, you, you might be able to achieve the same ends, yeah. but through a different means. It, it, it kind of even gets back into some of that betterment stuff because we, that's really, that's, that's really going to, cause some serious problems for organizations because you have a location um, that just does something phenomenal. And again, it's, we think we can copy that and just plug that in somewhere else and it falls flat on its face and we're going, Oh, terrible managers. Right. Can you believe that fell flat? And it's, it has nothing to do with that, obviously. Right. It has everything. Right. It has the context has, it has everything to do with the context yes. in which it was applied. Right. And I think that's a piece that we forget, especially in around safety. We tend to strip away as much context as we can when really we need to be seeking to understand that context. Um, I, I, had, I had a great conversation with Mark Alston a while back, uh, and that's what he was talking about. He's like, in, in any other scientific endeavor, we would just be appalled that we were saying we do this without context, but yeah. not safety. Safety is so special that we don't allow context. <laughs> So I thought I thought that that was such that's something that's really stuck with me. I've repeated it in several podcasts since then because I just thought that I had not I had not thought about it from Mark's perspective like that. I was like that's so true. We try our best to strip away every ounce of context that we can in the safety space. And again, we should really be doing the opposite. We should be really trying to seek to understand uh, that context. It seems like I think yeah I think that is that is so interesting. That is so interesting because especially as you go down that path of uniqueness, especially as you go down that path of different location to different location, um, just embracing that uniqueness, looking at it for what it is. Again, I think that that's, that's really caused probably more harm than it has good in certain things that we try to copy and paste. Um, because especially I, I can speak to power generation. Power generation is notorious for this, uh, whether it's nuclear generation, fossil generation, it's just power generation. Um, and there are other industries that are, that are just as notorious for it, but we'll say, we don't know how to deal with the problem. What should we do? I don't know. Let's ask everybody else and do exactly what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm not, I'm not throwing benchmarking under the bus. I think there's a lot to be said there. I think there's a lot to be said about going out and learning from others that have already done things, but it kind of goes back to your point of kind of seeing what they did, but coming back and actually doing something that's unique to maybe us or our location, our organization, because so often I think that that, that desire to, to go out and just say, okay, collectively, this is what the group's doing. We're just going to do this as well. It seems like at some point that would actually stifle innovation, that it would actually stop us from growing and be, becoming better. Yes. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, um, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but Jim Collins had written a book from good to great. And I think, um, the companies that he studied, I, I, I apologize, I wasn't prepared to talk about this and I don't, I don't have the numbers, but an no, appreciable sorry. number of the companies that he studied um, had lost their status of being great and, uh, and or went out of business altogether. So, I mean, unless you understand what's getting you to be great, I mean, and that, that's one of the quotes that I have on my website because when I saw him speak, he said, that you know, if you if, if you're in an organization or you have but even more, if you have invested in an organization, let's get it back to money because that's what a lot of people mm -hmm. value. Yeah. Um, and so you have uh, some kind of shares in in a company, 
then watch that CEO if they're on the top of their game, because the CEO typically is to be giving speeches all over the place. And Jim Collins said, see what he says about how they got to where they are. And if he doesn't say anything about it, see if you can question him about it. And if he genuinely doesn't know, get your money out of the company. Because yeah. you, you are then probably at the top of your game by luck. And luck is not something we have control over. It's not something that we can actually, you know, control or, you know, respond to very easily. And, you know, any perturbation in the market or in, the, you know, in, in their domain is going to tip them off of being the best because they don't know how they got there. They don't know how to sustain it. Right. And that, that even brings us kind of full circle back into that learning from success. You even kind of, kind of touched on a little bit of that, that, you know, it's, it's a beef that I have and most, most kind of safety better people are going to have with, as we kind of go down this path of, if we, we spent so much time looking at how we fell and that's really not the majority of our work. Most of our organizations do safe and stable work 99.9999% of the time, right? We do Absolutely. amazing things the majority of the time, but we never, I won't say we never, there's a lot of organizations out there that do. I, I really love that point of looking at seeing what the, you know, listening to that CEO and really seeking to understand that. Uh, but I think that, that most organizations could at least do a better job in that and looking at why we're successful those 99% that 99% of the time. Where, you know, how, does, how do we actually manifest success, right? Because so often we're, we're still dealing with the same bad, nasty stuff in the world. We're still having to adapt and overcome. We're still people. We're still these wretched, terrible people, right, that make mistakes and have errors and have biases and have all this stuff. How do we as an organization or how, do, how does this organization get past all of that stuff to still generate success? I think that's a much better question, it seems like, for organizations to ask themselves. Absolutely. And I, they're probably, they'll get at data that they had never gotten before. And it'll probably give them insights into how they operate that they, they could start using in their decision making and in their, in the way that they operate. So I think it would be a value to them. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with us. I've got one thing that I've got to ask. If, if you've listened to the show, you'll know if you, ha if you haven't gotten through some of them yet, you might not know, but I always have one famous question to ask everybody. Right, it's this. It's it's any last words. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. For some reason, I just said that. But then somebody's like, "What? What do you? What do you any final words?" But any any words for a, a good chunk of our audience uh, is is leaders and safety professionals in particular, and hop folks out there, and folks that are really kind of on the 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 outside or challenging the status quo and to try to do safety a little bit better. Any words of wisdom for those folks? Any go dos? Anything that you would challenge them to do? better or any, any words of encouragement, just anything that you'd like to share with those folks on, on the, the sharp end of trying to make that stuff happen out there? Well, I think um, it's not nothing new. I think you've said it yourself. Um, uh, a lot of this, this stuff um, is going to reveal things that um, leaders of organizations don't know and maybe don't even want to know. And uh, I can remember when, uh, like, I, I just started my consulting uh, practice, but um, it, I took some time to get ready for this, and I interviewed a lot of people to figure out um, how to even do this, because it's kind of a big deal to to leave your job and go out on your own, and, you know, so, <laughs> so it came uh, with, a, with a lot of consideration, and I had, um, I had talked to Jeff Lith, I don't know if you know him. But um, he was one yeah. of the people that I had spoken with uh, because he's been uh, consultants on and off for a long time. And so I asked him about this because I talked to people who were consulting outside of this area, but a mm -hmm. few inside this area. So um, mm -hmm. I asked him exactly this question. How do you tell leaders that their baby is ugly? Yes. Yeah. And he said, Oh, well, that's easy because everybody's baby is ugly. Right. You just have to remind them, <laughs> go to the nursery. Everybody's baby's ugly. Right. Like, uh, or, if you have an organization, you have organizational deficiencies. That's just the way it is. Yeah. yeah. So just live with it. It's, re it's better to know about these deficiencies. Mm -hmm. 
than not to know about them. That's so it. just, you know, just try to encourage the leaders to accept that they're not alone in this. It's not only them. That's huge. Oh, that's yeah. I love that. I love that. Everyone's baby is ugly. Absolutely. <laughs> I think that's 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 a great ending point for me. <laughs> and I agree. That's that's a place that most most organizations struggle because it's still our baby, right? It's that's still right. our baby, right? That's great. That's excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on and hanging out. This has been an absolute blast. People are going to love this one. Well, thank you so much, Sam. It's been delightful. Oh, and before we go, I. I you should, you should throw rocks at me for almost forgetting. How can people get a hold of you? How can people find you? You just have a brand new website that you just launched. So how can people get a hold of you? So my website is not Googleable yet because the SEO hasn't been done on it yet because mm-hmm. it's brand. It, it is my baby, right? So it's probably ugly. But anyway. <laughs> Mine is too, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so it's www dot beyond safety compliance dot ca mm. and my email is tanya at beyond safety compliance dot ca and that's that and i'm on linkedin and uh yeah it's about everywhere that's and i'll i'll uh, i'll provide some links in the show notes for those of you that are listening in here you can just probably click on this stuff down below uh, and find everything that you need to find i checked out the website i will tell you your baby is not ugly it's a very nice website <laughs> so no 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 self-deprecation there as far as that website goes that's a phenomenal well, website. So i like much. it i like it a lot <laughs> so everybody make sure you go check all that out as i said i'll link the, all that down below in the show notes so thanks again well thank you Oh, 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 oh,